The Tom Woods Show, episode 1953. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Our old friend Murray Sabrin joins us once again today. Murray taught finance at Ramapo College in New Jersey for many years. He's the author of numerous books, most recently, and of course the one we'll be talking about today, Universal Medical Care from Conception to End of Life, The Case for a Single-Payer System. But I'm telling you, it's not what you're thinking when you hear the case for a single-payer system. So we're going to unravel that with our very, very good free market friend, Murray Sabrin. Murray, welcome back. Thank you, Tom. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, Now that I'm a Florida resident, we're practically neighbors. Yes, that's right. I'm so glad about that, by the way. Now, I'm holding your book in my hand right now. And from the moment I heard about it, I thought, this is one of the sneakiest books I think I have ever encountered because of the title. So I already told everybody the full time, Universal Medical Care from Conception to End of Life, The Case for a Single Payer System. That is, let's say, maybe a little misleading given how the term single payer system is often used. What do you have in mind for a single payer system and what do people traditionally mean by that? Well, single payer usually means that the government is going to basically pay for your medical care from cradle to grave. There were several models of single payer system. One is the government takes over everything, which I guess would be the English model, where you have the National Health Service controlling everything regarding health care. Then you have sort of the Canadian system, which uh, is basically a single payer system. And you can, I think, opt out, not opt out, but get medical care by going to the United States, which people do to Detroit and and other parts of the uh, northern part of the United States. But my single payer system is diametrically opposed to what Bernie Sanders wants with Medicare for all. In other words, the individual and the family are the single payer. And the dirty secret in America is that we're overinsured. We insure just about every sort of medical expense there is, which is not the purpose of insurance, as we all know. The purpose of insurance is to make you whole for catastrophic loss, which is not to see a doctor for a sore throat or an earache or a pain in in the um, stomach, what have you. So I deliberately subtitled it, The Case for Single Payer, because there are two types of single payer, quote, in the extreme. One is the government control of, of medical care, and the other is the individual patient, the individual family is control of medical care by either paying um, cash and having a policy, an insurance policy to take care of the really big expenses, which we know can be catastrophic financially. So that's what I did in this book is to lay out the roadmap of how we got from where we are with the creation of the welfare state to what needs to be done to get us to high quality, low priced medical care. And I think that would be a great saving and benefit to the American people, because I think we're close to $4 trillion a year in medical care, and um, it's unsustainable. It's increasing much faster than the rate of inflation or people's incomes, and uh, it's getting more and more difficult to get that type of quality medical care and uh, having prices kept down. So there are a lot of initiatives in the works. I recently attended the uh, annual Free Market Medical Association annual uh, meeting, And I uh, did a book signing and gave a brief talk and met these wonderful doctors and other medical professionals who are taking the initiative to make sure their employees are in uh, good health by not having traditional insurance and doctors that are using um, the market system to provide medical care. So I'm excited about the future of medical care. It's just about getting the message out because all people hear about is that we've got to expand Medicare, Medicaid, and we've got to uh, do something more with the traditional insurance with the employer uh, providing it, which we know is a relic of World War II because of wage price control. So I I go into the details in my book. So if you don't mind, I'd like to go over the big, big picture of medical care. And the way I'd like to do it is to give uh, my own personal experience with the medical care system since I was a little kid. And um, when we moved from the Lower East Side of Manhattan, where we lived when we first came to America in 1949, to the time we moved to uh, the Bronx in 1953. My younger brother was born in May of 1953, and we moved in August of 1953. My mother needed a pediatrician for a newborn, so she uh, 
called a friend who said, there's a young doctor that I know about that I'm going for my children. And she recommended Dr. Saul Zucker. Uh, the name Zucker sounds familiar. His son, Howard, is the New York State Health Commissioner, who was at one time the deputy director of the WHO. So the first time I recall going to Dr. Zucker was probably 1955 in the fall after I broke my arm that summer up in the Catskill Mountains. And so I saw Dr. Zucker and I remember my parents taking me there. And what was the cost of a doctor's visit, a pediatric doctor's visit in 1955, $5.00. And stayed that way for several years. And I remember going up to $7 and then $10. And he would make house calls on Wednesday. And he was just an incredibly gifted doctor. They called him the baby doctor. God knows how many babies he uh, he had his patients over the decades that he was a doctor. And then he finally moved to New Jersey in 1975 and retired at age 80. And that's my initial experience with the medical profession. And um, in New Jersey, we've had great doctors for the past 40 years since when we moved to uh, Bergen County from 1982 to the time we left uh, two months ago, and we had wonderful doctors, dentists, doctors, you name it, specialists. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, you had to have insurance to see them, or you didn't have to sign. I guess you could pay by cash. But the point is, you have to have insurance to see an eye doctor for a visit doesn't make any sense to me, and I think it doesn't make any sense to most people. But it's, this is, to quote Hyman Roth from Godfather 2 regarding speaking to Michael Corleone. This is the business we've chosen. Well, this is the government we've chosen. And it's just all consuming. And the traditional insurance doesn't make financial sense. And we know it's not sustainable. So when I look at medical care and I look at my own experience with the medical care system, it's worked pretty well for me, but it's so expensive now. And now being on, on Medicare, it's even more bureaucratic and moving to a new area after having doctors for 40 years up in New Jersey, I can tell you from uh, experience the last two months, it is a real challenge to try to see a doctor to be a new patient. There's sometimes a four-week, six-week, eight-week lag to see a doctor, which I think is totally unacceptable if you're coming to a new area to see a doctor for a, a basic visit. So again, I'm as you know, someone who's involved in Austrian economics and the libertarian movement since 1974, and I think we have an opportunity with this book to provide people with the information they need to say, ha let me think about medical care in a way that I never thought about it before, namely that I have to be in charge of my medical care and I have to be in charge of my health. And what we do in this country, which I think is unfortunate, or which I point out in the book, is that we conflate health care and medical care. And they're two separate things. Medical care is what we seek when we need to see a physician or a specialist because we need intervention because our health is not optimal. And health care is very simple. We have to look in the mirror and we are responsible for our health care. So I have a whole chapter on wellness, which I think people will appreciate of how we can get back to better health without all these medical intervention. So Health starts with the individual, what they eat, what they don't eat, what they exercise, what they don't exercise, and to make sure that you're in optimal health. Tom, I can tell you in the last years of my parents' lives, in their late 80s, when we used to visit them, one of their cabinets in the kitchen looked like a mini pharmacy. And I said to myself, when I get to be hopefully in the 80s, I won't have a mini pharmacy in the uh, apartment or house, wherever we're living, because you don't know what all the interactions are regarding uh, medicine. And so I take a very holistic approach. I've been working with a naturopath for a couple of decades now, and he's a great naturopath. And I interviewed him for my chapter on wellness, and we have a great experience of his journey to better health. And so what I try to do is make this sort of like a, not a sort of a guide, but to get people to think about their own health, their own well-being, and that we have to have a better way to pay for all this, which is really consuming a good portion of employers' budgets and individual budgets, and just making it very bureaucratic for people to get basic medical care and specialty care. So um, I think we have an opportunity with this book as more people read it and what I'm going to do with the royalties to uh, have an impact on the national discourse about medical care. Because right now, medical care seems to be a one size fits all. Government has to increase its oversight, its direct intervention to medical care. And the doctors are basically becoming almost civil servants of the medical care system. And doctors are now becoming part of hospitals. And so we're corporatizing 
medical practices, which is destroying the doctor-patient relationship. To give you some example, I called up to get a, a visit to a primary care physician to see if where we would be compatible. And I was told a first visit to a doctor to be a new patient is 40 minutes. All other visits are 15 minutes. And so you have sort of assembly line medicine in America today, which had never happened when I was younger. Never. You never had a time limit. You spoke to the doctor. And the great times I had with one of my doctors, my ophthalmologist, and we would talk about politics and economics, and he would check my eyes, and we would spend a half hour, 40 minutes together. And so he was my ophthalmologist for uh, nearly 40 years, and then his sons uh, entered the practice, and one of them really helped me when I had a problem a few years ago. And so my wife and I have been fortunate that we've had great doctors up north, but coming to a new area to get established with a doctor-patient relationship has been one of the most frustrating and difficult things we've uh, encountered in our nearly 53 years of marriage, which will take place next uh, week. So um, again, I thank you for this opportunity because uh, I think doctors are realizing that they can't be a clog in this big medical bureaucracy that has been created over the decades. And I just got off the phone uh, recently with a director of a hospital in uh, Fort Myers, and I told her about my book. She's going to get it. She's going to listen to the podcast, and uh, hopefully I can make a presentation to her staff about a vision that I have for medical care, which is not my unique vision. Other people have been writing about this for, for years and years and years, but I thought I would put it all together in this one book that would give people at least an opportunity to think about what has happened since uh, Medicare and Medicaid were created, since uh, Obamacare was passed. And I think this is what people want to know is what is the best way to have optimal medical care, optimal health without costing an arm and a leg, and they being in charge of, by being a direct payer of it. And people can't wrap their head around it. That's why I wrote this book. People can't wrap their head around direct paying for medical care because they've been told it's your right. You have a right to medical care, which I think is one of the great fallacies of our time. And I think that's unfortunate because um, government can't even do well what it's supposed to be, according to Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. And yet they're going into areas that they have no business in because they're not authorized to be in there by the Constitution. And we know that there are not enough good incentives for doctors to be serving their patients and serving the bureaucracy, especially the insurance companies. I've become more and more concerned about the way the insurance companies are structured because everything has to be coded, everything has to be approved, and you feel like you're not in charge of your medical care. And so that's why I think this book hopefully will be read by as many people as possible. All your listeners read about it, tell other friends about it. And what I'm going to do with the royalties for the book is very simple. I'm going to be supporting uh, free market organizations like LouRockwell.com, which we've been supporting since it was created in 1982, the Ron Paul Institute and the Free Market Medical Association, as well as nonprofit medical centers, health centers, uh, one that I helped create in Bergen County, New Jersey, and two that I've been supporting financially for several years now. So if there's a need in Fort Myers, I will try to help create one in Fort Myers because this is the model for providing medical care to the uninsured, the low-income folks who really don't have much means to do so. And the model works great. It's based upon volunteers in medicine that was created in Hilton Head, South Carolina by Dr. Jack McConnell. And they have uh, facilities all over the country. And some of them are doing incredible work at no cost to taxpayers. It's all, it's all voluntary contribution. So this is part of the libertarian approach to social economic issues is how do we get a sector of the economy, which is so vital for people to be in good health and get quality medical care at an affordable rate and also provide medical care to people who are either indigent or have low incomes. And the volunteer in medicine um, model works magnificently well. And uh, the more people that buy into it, Bill Gates and others that have zillions of dollars available to them, Michael Bloomberg, they can literally solve the problem of providing medical care to the indigent by getting rid of Medicaid and creating several thousand, probably five to 10,000 of these centers around the country that would be staffed by volunteer doctors and others. So that's what I'm hoping happens because we have a lot of work to do in the liberty movement to reach the masses. And I hope this book reaches the masses. As you know, it's every author's dream to be on the New York Times bestseller list. If that should happen with this book, then the conversation, I think, changes and we can offer an alternative to a government single payer. So uh, 
uh, love to do some Q&A with you to see exactly how we can get this message out to the masses. Well, first of all, I think the book is extremely convincing on a topic where, as you say, our point of view is very rarely heard. The closest it comes to being heard is in these extremely bad Republican Party proposals that just make you cringe. This is not really where we stand. Restoring the doctor-patient relationship and you know, allowing individuals to make informed decisions guided by prices the way they do for every other good in the marketplace. Yeah. And by the way, you know, you point out how backward and dysfunctional the current system is. And you point out also that in this system, people aren't paying out of pocket because they've been told they're entitled to it. But maybe people should connect those two things. Maybe the reason it's dysfunctional is that it is the one thing in the marketplace that I'm not paying for out of pocket. Maybe that's why it works so badly and the the prices are so opaque and exorbitant. Maybe there's a connection here. Now, in your book, I'm going to leave to the reader the set, very good, by the way, section on the development of the welfare state and then how we got to this condition where third party payers, uh, insurance companies, are paying, you know, generally paying the expenses. And this is, again, leading to a system where people don't feel in any way uh, guided by prices. These are both very important, but I have covered them a little. And, and in particular, because you're so focused on how do we get right now to where we want to be, I want to stay focused on that in our conversation. So first of all, can you explain in brief what a health savings account is? This is not, and is it a government program or is it kind of like trying to get exempted from various government requirements like taxation? Well, I think the best way to describe a health savings account is it's similar to an IRA where you put money in for retirement and this is where you put money in for medical expenses. That's the best way to describe it. And uh, you get a tax deduction for putting it in there. And so I think this is one way we could expand it under the current system where people will create an account that grows over time that they could use to pay for prescription drugs and specialty visits and what have you, and then have a separate policy for uh, catastrophic insurance. So again, there are several stools to a single payer individual family payer system, and that is direct primary care. And I know you've had uh, doctors who've explained that on your podcast in the past, where you pay a monthly fee to see a doctor on a 20, almost a 24-7 basis. Then you have a health savings account to pay for the more expensive medical needs that you have. And then you have a catastrophic insurance to pay for the big operations that could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I think if we have a free market medical system, those costs will come down. And I think a perfect example of that is the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, Dr. Keith Smith, who's the co-founder of the Free Market Medical Association, his prices are posted on, the, on his website. The prices are a fraction of what they are in hospitals. To give you an example, I interviewed a direct primary care doctor in Florida who referred one of her patients who wasn't insured to Dr. Smith's surgery center in Oklahoma. And the hospital quoted him, I think, $20,000 for an operation. And I think everything that the patient needed in terms of transportation, lodging, and the surgery was like $5,000, which was relatively affordable for someone who didn't have insurance. So there are so many examples of this, Tom, across the country where doctors are providing opaque pricing, a cost much lower than the um, traditional hospital. And there are other examples I learned at the Free Market Medical Association conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. So there are plenty of examples of doctors uh, taking uh, using the free market to provide clear pricing. Everything is transparent on their website. I think I misspoke before. I said opaque. It should have been transparent pricing. And so once you have transparent pricing, then the consumer is in charge because then they can decide, is this a good value for me? And this is basic Austrian economics 101. So I think that this is what needs to be done. Is doctors have to post their prices online. Hospitals have to post it. Surgery centers have to post it. And consumers make that choice. I wonder why there are so few surgery centers of Oklahoma. You know, I know Dr. Smith and Lantier who are the ones behind that. I wonder what the problem, like, like for example, furthermore, I wonder why there aren't more direct primary care doctors. They could get out from under all kinds of regulations and red tape. I think the direct primary care movement is an amazing example of how 
when the free market has even just a little crack in the door, that when the door is open a little slightly just to let the free market in, it can flourish. It just needs that little inch of space and it can flourish. And I wish we could see more of this. And instead, it seems like the trend is toward more and more doctors getting frustrated with the current system and just retiring yep. or, you know, and, and not, not thinking about what their options are. That's exactly what's been happening. We met a physician, a neighbor physician the other day, and he told us about a primary care doctor, his primary care doctor. So we, we called to find out if we could become patients. And uh, we were told the doctor is no longer accepting any patients because he's probably going to be retiring soon. So this is the frustrating aspect of uh, where we're headed with doctors are getting burned out. That's one of the um, anecdotal information that we have about doctors, primary care doctors that are being burned out because they seek so many patients. A typical doctor has about 2,000 patients, while a direct primary care doctor has around 800 patients, which is much more manageable because you're not seeing those patients on a regular basis. If they have uh, chronic conditions, you can either manage it or they have to see a specialist. So that's what's happening in the field is that doctors are also gravitating toward the um, higher um, price specialties and neurology and other things where they can earn uh, several times the amount that they can earn as a primary care physician. But that's what the country needs now is more direct primary care physicians, as I experienced as a youngster who took care of most of our needs as uh, from childhood to um, young adulthood. to uh, And he also kept us on as patients when now we became um, adults for a while. So again, the whole practice of medicine has turned upside down. Instead of having a doctor-patient relationship, we're now having a doctor-corporate patient relationship, which I think is not healthy in the long term for everyone. All right, before we continue, let me take a brief minute to say a word for our sponsor, BitTrust IRA. The cryptocurrency world has gotten a bit more user-friendly, but it can still be intimidating for beginners. And for folks who are thinking it would be wise to diversify their portfolios with an asset like Bitcoin, well, how do you go about doing that? And the answer is with the help of BitTrust IRA, because they will help you seamlessly and securely add cryptocurrency to your portfolio. They store your private keys in nuclear bunkers with military-grade encryption. They have a 24-7 trading platform with no minimum investments and unlimited trades, plus a team to help guide you along the way if you have any questions. They also offer the lowest trading fees in the industry. So go to bittrustira.com slash woods today to learn more. And for a limited time, Bittrust IRA is waiving the sign-up fee for Tom Woods Show listeners. That's a $50 value. That's bittrustira.com slash woods. B-I-T-T-R-U-S-T-I-R-A dot com slash woods. You know, there's another aspect of all this, and... Of course, health is not just a matter of, uh, oh, well, I, I got sick for some unknown reason and now I have to go see the doctor. Health is a day-by-day -day ongoing thing that mm -hmm. it's not something that happens to us. I mean, to some degree, sometimes it does. I mean, sometimes you get cancer and there's nothing you can do about that. But what I mean is the sorts of decisions we make every day about the food we eat, the time yep. we spend outdoors, the exercise we get, the way we treat our bodies and what we put inside them, these things are important. And of course, if we did a better job of this, well, we wouldn't have to be navigating any type of healthcare system, no matter what kind it is. And that tends to get lost. And of course, we've seen that in the, in the time of COVID. People are telling us about vaccines and drugs and all that. And those sorts of things can have their place. But they're not saying, well, gee, what, are the, what is the outline, the health outline of somebody who does well when he gets hit with COVID versus somebody who does not? And there are various things that you can do to come as close as you can to approximate that kind of health profile. And again, they have to do with, they certainly have, have a connection to vitamin D levels. You'd have to be an idiot not to see that by this point. But there are all kinds of other things you can do. Try to keep your weight within certain limits and so on and so forth. This all gets left out. The sorts of things the individual himself can do. And I think some of that has to do with because people aren't responding to real prices and everything just sort of seems like, well, somebody else will take care of it, there's really yeah. less of an, an imperative to play your role, to realize you have a role to play in your own health. It's not just drugs and doctors. Well, this is why the chapter on wellness, I think, is so informative, Tom. One of the things the naturopath said in our interview, which I think is really insightful, is that he said when 
cancer patients get chemotherapy and they're finished with the chemotherapy, they typically get sugary drinks or food afterwards. And the naturopath told me, uh, whose name is Dr. Glenn Gero, a great naturopath in northern New Jersey, he said, that's the worst thing for cancer patients because cancer thrives in a sugary environment. And so he said, when he lectures at medical schools, he asks the medical students, how much nutrition education do you get during your uh, education? He said, uh, maybe a, an afternoon or a day of, of uh, nutritional information. I think this is one of the great failings of our medical care system is that the doctors are woefully ignorant of uh, nutrition. And I think that has to change. And that's why I think that chapter five on wellness should open people's eyes to what is the responsibility of the individual? What should doctors know about nutrition? Because as you know, most doctors are trained where you see somebody's symptoms and you treat the symptoms as opposed to the whole person. And I've always been an advocate of healthy eating and taking supplements. I've been taking supplements for more than 50 years now. And as they say, knock on wood, things have been uh, working out relatively well. Um, so again, this is why education, the free market for pricing and giving people more choices, and instead of relying on this incredibly bureaucratic system that we have today. So let's think here. I mean, the tricky part would be how to get from here to there. Yeah. And and I really, frankly, I'm not interested in the legislative process of how we get from here to there. It's more a matter of changing the way people think. I mean, in other words, there are ways people can get much better and much, much more affordable medical care even now, even in the present system, because as I say, that door is open just a little bit. And they can do that by means of these direct primary care physicians who will just say it's $75 a month and you get all these zillions of benefits. Right. There are more of those all the time, but I, I wish it would explode even more. We have that. Then we have other ways people can do it. There are these various health share kinds of yeah. programs where it's technically not insurance. It's right. people all pitching in together to take care of each other, but they have to have some kind of religious basis, I think. So even that is just a small little opening. So it's really a matter of alerting people to the options they have. But beyond that, it's going to be trickier to tell them this will work for Medicare and Medicaid. I think that's where the battle is a little bit uphill philosophically. How do you overcome that? Well, that's a great point. And I tried to address that. And uh, unfortunately, it's going to take some legislative changes to do yeah, that, which yeah. of course I don't think the country is ready for. But I outlined how we could do that. So that's, I, I forgot what number chapter that is in, but I discussed how Medicare can be changed. But Medicaid can be can be addressed through these volunteer uh, medical centers. And I helped create one in Bergen County, which receives no taxpayer dollars. It's all voluntary contributions. And they're doing great work. They're saving people's lives and getting them back to better uh, health. But I want to get back to one point. You know who may lead the charge here? Employers. Let me give you an anecdote of one of the... Um, speakers at the Free Market Medical Association presented, which I thought was fascinating. And when your listeners hear this, steam will be coming out of their ears. This one company, I think it's in Wisconsin, they decided that they would develop their own employer-based clinic, and they had a van there or a truck to do MRIs in which the company or the employees was charged $400 for the MRI. That same truck went down the street to a hospital, and guess what the hospital charged for the MRI? $6,000. Oh, my for the gosh. Same for the same $400 MRI, which means the hospital was raking in $5,600 for doing nothing. Now, if that doesn't get you angry, I don't know what will, because that has to be paid out of insurance. So therefore, the insurance rates have to go up to cover the hospital's bill for the MRI. This is an example of how employers are saying there's something dysfunctional about a system which the premiums are going up every year, the co-pays are going up, and uh, the employees are not getting a good deal, and the employers are not getting a good deal. Remember, employer-based insurance is very expensive because that affects the bottom line. So if you can reduce an employer's medical costs from X percent to X minus 20 percent, X minus 40 percent, X minus 50 percent or more, Everyone's going to benefit from that. I want to actually go backwards for a minute, if you don't mind, and ask you a little bit about Obamacare and just what is the role that that played 
in either making the situation better or worse. Now, obviously, I know which way it went, <laughs> but yeah. how significant was it? And what were its main features driving either the good or the bad outcomes? Well, I think the primary one, again, it's such a huge bill. What was it, uh, over 2,000 pages and nobody read it, and yet it's the law of the land. I interviewed um, a freelancer who told me how Medicare really ruined his life in terms of the cost structure, and I published his email to me about it. Essentially, what Obamacare does is try to create a universal medical care system for the uninsured by creating huge subsidies with very high deductibles. So it's a total ripoff of the average person because if they use that money for direct primary care and health savings account and bought a catastrophic policy for most people, that's sufficient to get to where we'd like to get, which is the individual family single payer system. But instead, Obamacare is really a way station toward a single payer system. And the same thing with Social Security, to jump back historically, when Social Security was proposed, there was a a medical care component that some people wanted. And Roosevelt said, no, the people aren't ready for a medical care component of Social Security. So we'll wait on that. And of course, it happened 30 years later in 1965, when Social Security was passed August 14th of 1935. So again, they know, the left knows how to create more statism. It's that they do it incrementally over generation over generation. So I think what we have to say is, listen, this thing is unsustainable and here are the alternatives that will lower everyone's cost and provide us better quality healthcare. And I think that's the message of the book. And it goes into great detail of all these different programs. Well, one thing that will help too is that the book is not... As with some libertarian books, it's not purely theoretical. So in other words, we can show real life examples of what we're talking about. I mean, the direct primary care example is is a very good one because here are actual doctors offering really, really amazing bundles of services at very, very impressive prices. And this is what the whole system would look like if we didn't have all these bungling intermediaries. So you don't have to take my word for it. You can look at this and this and this and this and this. And likewise for the types of clinics that you're talking about, as you say, you've been heavily involved in several of them and one in particular. And you can say, look, at this is something that, again, we'd have a million times more of these under a system, you know, other than what we have now. So which direction do you want to move in? Yeah, the thing is, as you know, when you're selling something, you got to sell the benefits yes. and how people will be better off. That's the key. And that's, I think, what I've done in this book is to show everyone will be better off except the insurance companies and the hospitals that are overcharging people, given the alternatives are a fraction of what hospitals are charging for the same exact service. Yes, exactly, exactly. So the book is Universal Medical Care from Conception to End of Life, The Case for a Single-Payer System. I have a link to where you can get it on Amazon at tomwoods.com slash 1953. So go pick this thing up. And I mean, this is a topic that ought to be of interest to all of us. I mean, you're if you haven't got your health, what have you got? We all know, Tom, when you don't have your health, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you feel like in the same shape as someone who has a fraction of your net worth. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So it's very important that you get this right for yourself and we get this right as a country. And Murray Sabrin has made a very, very important contribution in getting us there. So check out Universal Medical Care from Conception to End of Life, linking to it at tomwoods.com slash 1953. Murray, great to talk to you again and uh, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate the opportunity to let your listeners know that we have an opportunity to get to a free society as quickly as possible. All right, folks, remember, we are still going full steam ahead with the 2000th episode event in Orlando on October 16th of 2021. Now, it is true that I think by the time we get there, we're only gonna be on about like episode 1991 or something, but that's way, way better than what happened last time because of the hurricane. I had to skip episode 1000 because we we had already gone past it before the event occurred because we had to delay it because of the hurricane. I actually wanted the event to happen before we get to number 2000 because that thing with the video, we're going to need to do some editing and then the audio version, I got to figure out which things to take out because they don't really work unless you can see it with your eyes and whatever. So there's going to be some post-production work that needs to be done. So it's just as well, by the time we get to the slot, the day when we're at number 2000, it will be ready to go. So it's working out absolutely perfectly. So 
we still have some rooms in our room block. We ran out of rooms. They gave us some more. We put them out there. TomWoods2000.com is where to go for that. We're going to have an amazing time. We got Michael Malice bringing a special surprise guest, and he says he's just bringing his A game, and he's not telling me what's going to happen, but that we're going to love it. I got the magic of Doc Dixon. This guy is an unbelievable magician. Fooled Penn and Teller on their TV show, and he's coming to do some magic for us, including sawing me in half. It involves a chainsaw. It's going to be unbelievable. I don't want to give away too much else of what's going on, but there'll be some surprises and a ton of fun. And at a time when so much of the the country is closing up to unvaccinated people and making it seem as if it's normal that a big chunk of society should be excluded from the normal pleasures of life. Well, here's a big pleasure and you're all invited. I don't care what the deal is with testing or vaccination or whatever. You make your own health decisions and come on down to the 2000th episode of the Tom Woods Show. Get the details at tomwoods2000.com. The tickets are free, but do please register for me. It it makes the logistics easier. So again, the website, tomwoods2000.com, and I hope to see you guys there. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.